Hey there, welcome to LSAT Demon Daily. I'm Ben Olson, that's Nathan Fox. We're the founders of LSATdemon.com and our weekly podcast, Thinking LSAT. We have an email here from Rhiannon. So we had all those success stories, Ben, earlier in our recording session today. We went through a dozen, or not a dozen, but half a dozen um, success stories, people who really killed it on the June test. But yeah, you know, shit happens. Like some people do better than they expected. Some people do worse than they expected. The people who do better, do better than they expected are over the moon. The people who do worse than they expected are sad. And where do we go from here? So I guess Rhiannon is probably a representative uh, example of that. Okay. She says, I'm thinking that if I want to take myself from an average PT of 163 to a 170, that I should be doing two timed tests per week for the next nine weeks or so, question mark. That was a question written in the form of a, of a declarative sentence. To get better at the LSAT, you do have to do practice problems, but this is way over-focused on the number of problems rather than learning from the problems that you do. Yeah, and full tests. Like the, the, you're doing a full test so that you can see whether you've hit your magical 170 yet, right? Yeah. That's not, that's not how it's done. The way this is done is you do one question at a time, you get it right. But if you don't get it right, then you figure out why the hell you're not getting it right. And you use our written explanations. You use our video explanations. You use our ask button, which gives you access to a team of tutors who will respond lightning fast to your questions. And that's how you get better. You know, if you got like, instead of this two tests per week for nine weeks, you know, this is an 18 test plan. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 18 tests, 75 questions per test. So we're talking about, um, sorry, I'm bad at doing math in my head. 18 times 75, 1350. Yeah, I did it in my head. Okay. okay um, yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're talking about doing 1,350 LSAT questions. You really need to do, you need to be going for the clicks instead. And by click, what I mean is a question that previously didn't make any sense to you and now makes perfect sense to you because you've done the job of reviewing it to where you go, ah, shit, I see. Oh my God. Okay. So now I clearly see why B is correct. It's the one that answers the damn question. And I see why it's perfectly justified. I see how that's just obviously clearly correct. And not only that, but I see how this wrong answer that I picked, I would never make that mistake again. That was terrible. What was I thinking? Yeah, I'm glad you're describing the click that way because I do think some people think the click is like, oh yeah, I can see how C is better than D. No. No, it's, wow, D doesn't work. And <laughs> C works immensely well. So and C is right. I, I imagine you get this in class, right? Where it's like you're explaining a question and people are kind of nodding their heads and following along. And then someone asks a follow-up qu clarification question and you re-explain whatever you were just trying to explain. And they're like, oh, oh. I see it in the chat. It, I see yeah. it in their faces. You know, even yeah. people on mute, I see them going, oh. Or in the chat, someone writes all caps, oh. <laughs> like, yeah. It's uh, about injury, I, not about accidents. Uh, oh, it makes it's perfect like, sense. We didn't go from, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to hear what you're saying and what you're saying kind of seems to flow and make some sense. No, no. The logic clicks. Yeah. Yeah. The right answers are right. They're not like a little bit better. It's not like, oh, that one's just a little bit better fit. That's mm -hmm. never, that is never the case. Yeah. It's the only fit. The wrong answers do not fit. They are wrong. The right answers are right. And when you're scoring 163, that's a good place to be. But at 163, you know, you're probably missing. What is that? You're missing 15 out of 75. Just guessing. Yeah. And if you're missing 15 out of 75, then there's a lot that you don't understand. 
you're picking lots of, lo- of wrong answers. You're also getting lucky on a lot of questions, right? At 163, let's say you're missing 15. There's probably another 15 that you um, got right even though you kind of narrowed it down to a 50 50 and you were like, well, you know, B and D they're both good, but I think probably it's D well, half the time you get that right. Half the time you get that wrong. And you do that on 30 out of your 75 questions. And that's how you get a 163. Yeah. Which is good because you know, you're getting all the easy ones, right? There's lots of the tests that you perfectly do understand, but then there's a, there's much of the test, right? Like the second half of every section for you at this level is full of uncertainty. Yep. And like, you don't know whether you got it right or wrong until you check the answer key. And that's not what 170 feels like. What 170 feels like is first 20 on every section. I'm not missing more than like one of those. Like, I just know that they're right, but that's not what's happening at 163. Anyway, Rhiannon continues. I feel like my test fatigue is what puts the extra nail in my coffin because in blind review, I know what the right answer was. I find myself misreading questions or not reading thoroughly enough because I'm experiencing mental fatigue. Should I be doing three time, three section time tests or four? That's such the wrong question to ask right there, isn't it? Yeah. Like, Your fatigue, Rhiannon, comes from not understanding the questions. It it accumulates. It's like lactic acid building up in your muscles when you're doing a workout. You're having fatigue accumulate because you're not solving all of the questions. You're not solving each question one at a time. If you solved each question one at a time, then you would feel good. You would be like, yep, that one was kind of a hard one. It took me a little bit of extra time. I didn't like any of the answers at first. I thought all five answers were wrong. But then when I reread them, I see how this one answer, it's not just kind of right. It's perfectly right. It makes perfect sense. And then you confidently choose that one and you move on to the next one without an accumulation of fatigue. Yep. (laughs) Doing three section time tests or four section time tests is not the solution. Your solution is that you need to stop half-assing questions. You have to start getting them right instead of like half-assing it and moving on to the next one and then trying to get through this whole long grind. Like I I'm sure that Rhiannon thinks, well, to get 170, I obviously have to finish all the questions. Yeah. (laughs) You do not. You can comfortably leave a couple at the end of every section and still score in the 170s. Randomly guess on those. You'll still get one out of five of them right. But you do not have to do every question to reach 170. And I'm pretty confident, actually, that if you are doing every question right now, Rhiannon, that's actually what's holding you back from reaching 170. Because you've you've committed to this plan of I'm going to do all the questions. You're you're not capable of doing all the questions and solving them. So now you're just not solving the questions one at a time. Instead, you're doing this. Half assed fast reading, skimming, and you're kind of doing it, but you're not really doing it. So you get it down to a 50, 50 and you just pick one instead of getting it down to a 50, 50 and then solving it from there. And that's not how you reach 170. Like to reach 170, you solve those 50, 50s. You don't settle for those 50, 50s. You actually solve it to where it clicks. And then again, I just don't think that you're going to feel tired. Yeah. Uh, She continues, I'm feeling really overwhelmed with the amount of strategies that I could use. I genuinely do not know what is best for this final grind. I'm so glad you emailed in, Rhiannon. Ben, you want to give her a a prescription? She was planning to do 18 tests over the next nine weeks. What do you want her to do for these next nine weeks? I want her to focus on doing one question, either in drilling or one time section just pick one 35 minute section in a test, do that section and then review any questions that you missed. Focus on doing one question and then learning uh, as much as you can about understanding the questions that you struggled with. If you do that and you focus on (laughs) 
time. So for example, you say to yourself, I have an hour, I have two hours uh, today and I'm going to, that won't give me mental fatigue. I can, I can sit here for an hour this morning and an hour this afternoon. Then focus on how much time you're studying those two hours versus how many questions you're getting done. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're trying to, you're trying to do too much volume uh, thinking that the volume is going to just magically get you over the top. It's like, you're attacking a symptom instead of attacking the cause, right? She's yeah. attacking fatigue and she's like, well, because I'm getting fatigued, what I need to do is I need to work on my stamina. The way that yeah. I'm going to work on my stamina is I'm going to do a just an exorbitant number of questions. She's talking about doing again, 1,350 questions just from time tests. This is just from her full-time tests. In addition to probably other practicing that she was planning on doing drilling time sections, classes, whatever else she's doing with us, uh, here in the demon. And instead of all that, she really just needs to like, no study the right way for an hour. So go to the drilling tab in the demon. You can check this out for free. Get a LSAT demon free account, go to drill and just do one question, try to get it right. If you get it right and you feel totally confident about it, skip all the explanations, do another question. If you get it wrong, or if you struggle with the question at all, then spend however much time is necessary in order to get yourself that click where you're really convinced that the right answer is right and that the wrong answer is wrong. Again, we've got video explanations, we've got written explanations, and we've got a team of tutors who will email you back and who will help you to, to get to that click. And if you got one click out of your one hour of studying, I think that's a lot more valuable than doing a full practice test and feeling all fatigued and then doing probably a half-assed review. You know, she says in blind review, I, I know what the answer is. See, that's weird too. Like, I almost wonder if she's a demon student because in blind review in the demon, it doesn't show you what answer you chose. Well, maybe so, she's saying she picks the correct answer on the second time through. That's not that impressive, by the way, because you know you missed the question. So you're not going to pick the most attractive wrong answer that you picked the first time around. So the fact that you're able to correctly identify the correct answer on a second attempt, that's like the start of maybe your review. That's great. You know, good job. But that's not the end of the, it's, it's not just like, oh, great. I got it right the second time. So blind review, check, move on to the next one. Yeah. No. Why the fuck did you make that mistake? Like you have to stop making those mistakes. So is there something there that you did not fully clearly understand? You know, like look at that wrong answer you picked. Can you convince me why, like explain to me why that's wrong? Yep. Not just, oh no, the other answer's right. I got it right. I got it right on the second time. I got it. I know it. No, it's almost like <laughs> Rhiannon thinks the goal is to get the answer right. Right. <clears throat> and once that goal has been accomplished, right. she's done. It's like, no, yeah. the goal is to understand why the correct answer is yeah. correct. Why the wrong answers are wrong, regardless of what the hell you did yeah. in the test or during blind review. Now, this is the peril of doing too many time tests because it goes back to what I was saying earlier. My hypothesis remains that on a 75 question test, there are like 30 questions where she doesn't really understand it, but half of them she's guessing, right. You know, she's not falling. She's like the, the real bad answers. She's not picking those, but she's, she's like between the two best answers, right? Which one of them is superficially good. One of them is actually good. And she's not narrowing down the difference between superficially good and actually good. Yeah. So on blind, you know, and think about what happens, like the ones she got right, she doesn't even review those, even though she half asked it and guessed like half of those 50 fifties, she gets them right. And she's like, cool. Yeah, I got that nailed that one. Nah, not really. You, you, you had 30 of these questions that you weren't that sure about and you, you got half of them. So yeah. you didn't nail any of them. You got lucky on half of them and you got unlucky on the other half of them, but you don't know what's going on on these questions. So there are questions there that you don't really understand that you're not even reviewing. And then the ones that you missed, if all you're doing is doing them again and picking the right answer, well, no shit, you're picking the right answer because you probably had it narrowed down to a 50, 50 to begin with. Yeah. 
So you're going to keep making the same mistakes, which is why yeah. your score isn't going up. And yeah, you, you, and then because your score is not changing, you're like, oh shit, I got to do more work, but you're doing more of the wrong work. Yeah. You need to do it slower. So again, drilling one question at a time, maybe mix in some timed sections. If you just did one timed section of games, one timed section of reading comp and one timed section of LR every week then you would be doing a full timed test every week, but you would be doing it in a more civilized way that is more conducive to review. Because yep. if you do a timed section, then you can sit down and thoroughly review all of the ones that you struggled with, which is not just the ones you missed, by the way, at your level, you're probably struggling with some of the ones you're getting right. So you should go in and you should thoroughly review those. That's a much better use of your time. I would vastly prefer that you go deep on 25 questions or, you know, you, f you solve 15 of them and then there's 10 of them that you struggle with and you go deep on those 10, right? That is a good use of your time. Doing 75 questions and then who knows what you're going to do? <laughs> like, oh, I blind reviewed the ones that I missed and I got all those ones right on blind review. So, yeah, you know, it took you 10 minutes to review the whole test. <laughs> you're not getting out of your review what you could be getting. And that's why you're not making the improvement that you want to make. Thank cool. you, Rhiannon. Please email daily at lsatdemon.com if you'd like to ask us a question or share some LSAT or law school admissions news. Thanks for listening.